Right, we'll get started then. Welcome to the Development Committee, 18th of October 2018. Just to our usual announcement, should we be required to evacuate the building, would you please leave the building via a nearest available exit to the chamber? Our assembly point will be in the public car park at the side of the Civic Suite. Please don't delay your evacuation by collecting any belongings. Please don't return into the building until given permission to do so by council staff. Please note that the meeting will be audio recorded. And can I remind you to switch off your phones or turn them to silent, please? Thank you. Apologies for absence. They've been received from Councillor Mrs. Hoy and Councillor Milne. And item two is substitute Councillor Lucas Gill, substituting for Councillor Milne. Um, item three, non-members attending, I can see Councillor Stanley and Councillor Gooding. Item four, minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of September 2018. Be happy for me to sign those as a correct and accurate record of that meeting. Yes. Thank you. Item five is declarations of interest. Councillor Steptoe. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've got quite a number, so please bear with me. Uh, with items six and seven, I'm... County Councillor for Roach South and Ward Councillor for Rochford South. With reference to item 8.1, Rose Dean, uh, I'm County Councillor for Roach South, Ward Councillor for Rochford South and Barling Parish Council. Right. Councillor Arno. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got a few as well. Land East of Rugby, Rugby Club, item six, uh, Ward Councillor for that area. Uh, airport building, I'm a member of the uh, Airport Liaison Committee. That's it, thank you. I'm uh, Ward Councillor for 8.1 and 8.2. Oh, sorry, 8.2 and 8.3, sorry. Councillor Lucas Gill. Uh, ward member for um, item six, item seven, again, ward member, and I'm also on the airport consultative committee, and uh, item eight, ward member. Okay, Councillor Stepto, you want to add more? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, other councillors have reminded me I'm also a member of the airport consultative committee. Okay, thank you. Um, just for reference, it's not necessary to declare that you're a, ward a district ward, ward councillor. No. Just for future reference. Okay, thank you. Um, item six, land to the east of the Rugby Club Aviation Way, Rochford. There's information on the addendum for this one as well, just for reference. Uh, Chairman, this is a reserve matters application for consideration of the layout, appearance, scale and landscaping in association with works to construct an employment unit for B1 office and B2 in general industrial use. The site area is outlined in bold on the attached plan. Chairman, can, can you move the mic a Yes, sorry, can you hear me okay? I'll come a bit closer as well. To the southeastern corner of the wider business park is where this site area is located. Uh, it was granted outline permission in 2016, the wider business park, and it borders commercial units in Aviation Way. Is that a bit better? Can you hear me clearly now? Thank you, Katie. The existing layout plan shows the current situation at the wider site. A new roundabout has been... I don't know if I've uh, gone, have I? Yeah, it's gone the wrong way. Mm. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> right. I'll continue for the time yeah. being. The existing layout plan shows the current situation at the wider site. So we've got a new roundabout uh, constructed within Cherry Orchard Way uh, to the northwest of the application site, along with a roundabout within the actual business park itself, and a spine road linking to the approved um, Westcliff Rugby um, Club, which is currently under construction. If we'd have plan three, please, thank you. And this, so this is an updated indicative master plan, um, which has been provided with the current application. Uh, it's showing how the development proposed as part of the reserve matters application <laughs> would align with the wider business park. So you can see the application currently before us is this sort of section here within the wider business park site. Uh, 
It should be noted that the outline planning application is the overarching decision, which looked at matters relating to construction management and 106 contributions, to name but a few. It is not for the application currently before us to revisit the matters already considered as part of the outline application, many of which are controlled by conditions imposed on the outline application. The current reserved matters proposal includes a large rectangular building in this location here, um, providing manufacturing, office and other ancillary space for the intended operator, IPECO. There will be two axes to the site, one from the main looped spine road, so that would be in this location here, which would provide access to a parking area to the north of the building. Here. The other would be from the spine road and would provide access to a service yard and refuse areas. So that's this one here. That's where the uh, service yard area would be located. Soft landscaping would also surround the site um, in various locations around the border. So this plan shows the intended design of the building. The walls would include metal sheet cladding in black and grey colouring installed horizontally and vertically across the elevations. The key material planning considerations are access, parking, layout, appearance, scale and landscaping. With regard to access, County Highway does not object to the proposal, subject to a condition regarding visibility displays. They refer to the need for the gate control to, to be set back to allow a HGV to stand clear of the carriageway. The gate control was conditioned as part of a previous reserved matters application and would be addressed through a discharge of condition. The proposed access arrangements are not considered objectionable here. The parking proposal shows 226 parking spaces. The parking standards document requires 268. However, such requirement is a maximum figure within our, within our document guidance. Cycle provision meets policy and the power to wheeler provision is slightly below the requirement. However, a condition has been suggested to address this. Use of the minimum parking bays is proposed. Concern was raised with regards to this within the officer report and a condition suggested to address this. However, it's considered that as the outline design codes showed use of the minimum bays and because the applicant has now provided what they consider to be exceptional circumstances, that use of the minimum bays would be acceptable. Members may be aware that the council lost an appeal seeking to enforce the preferred parking bays at KS KFC, which are very nearby, which has similar characteristics to the site before us. With regards to layout, County Urban Design have provided detailed comments. They advise that surveillance could have been improved through a change in layout and fenestration. Officers consider that the general layout arrangements for the site are acceptable here. The appearance, so the height of the building is 10.5 metres, which adheres to the design code within the approved outline application. The design includes two gently curved roof forms, so you can see that here. Um, which adds visual interest as well as referencing the form and appearance of an aircraft hangar. The materials proposed are fit for purpose and adhere to the principles of the design code. County Urban Design Officer raises concern as the design code advises that buildings along the rural edge should reflect a more naturalistic environment through the introduction of timber and a natural colour palette. However, officers consider that the design is acceptable here. A condition requiring materials to be agreed has been attached to the recommendation. The scale is considered acceptable in terms of relationship with the wider site and neighbouring units. With regards to landscaping, a soft landscape buffer would surround the application site. Although this is not to the extent shown within the outline application, it is still considered to provide a sufficient landscaped edge here. Species mix, planting density and maintenance arrangements have not been provided, um, but a planning condition requiring this detail has been attached to the recommendation. Chairman, this application is recommended for approval, subject to conditions as set out in the officer report and addendum. Thank you. Thank you. We have a speaker on this, Mr. Diamond. Up to five minutes, I'll let you know when you've got a minute to go. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Nick Diamond. I'm a director at GL Hearn and planning consultant to the applicants, Henry Boot Developments. The application before you is the first in a series of reserve matters applications which are to come forward on the business park and de deliver the vision set out within the Joint Area Action Plan. The principle of development has been established by virtue of the 2016 outline permission which seeks up to 80,000 square metres of modern office and industrial uses on the site. This reserved matters application has been prepared within the approved parameters of that outline permission and will provide some 11,000 square metres of B1, B2 floor space. The supporting planning statement and design and access statement explains that the building has been designed to complement its surroundings as well as the wider landscape and settings. 
The proposal will facilitate the long-term aspirations of IPCO, who are currently located in a number of units across Aviation Way, and allow them to consolidate and retain their operation within the district. The proposal therefore specifically responds to IPCO's operational and parking requirements. The issue was just raised by your officer in relation to the minimum bays and that exceptional circumstances has been demonstrated. This fundamentally comes down to the fact that the proposal is to accommodate IPCO specific requirements. In summary, the proposal is the first phase of development on the business park. It complies with planning policy and will deliver first class flexible employment space for a long standing local employer. We welcome the officer's recommendation and trust that members will see fit to approve the application before you this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Members, on page 6.1 we have some recommendations with two additional conditions printed on, uh, on the addendums, uh, conditions 7 and 8. Do any members wish to speak on this one? Councillor Steptoe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, with reference to the entrance onto Aviation Way, it's going to be controlled. Um, can officers just point out on the diagram where that's going to be located? Um, it says in the addendum that it's a, a number plate recognition system. Uh, that's okay for vehicles that are um, registered with the company, uh, company vehicles, etc., etc. But how will delivery trucks be dealt with in that situation? Will they need to be pre-registered before the um, before they can deliver, or will there be somebody there to actually take calls to allow people in and out? Thank you, Jim. Does anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Hockway. Uh, <clears throat> yes, just a couple of questions. Is the um, parking area to the north of the building solely for <clears throat> the uh, the staff, or is it uh, for is there visitor parking spaces uh, as part of that uh, parking area, or are they meant to be parking uh, in a, uh, another area? Um, and um, <clears throat> As the building is uh, is adjacent to um, uh, the uh, a, a green area, there was mention about the um, uh, how the the building sort of like fits in with 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 a sort of like a neighbouring sort of green fields and stuff like that. What would what would the would normally happen to the the building? Is it to do with the the, the sort of colour of the cladding, how it blends in? Is that is that the uh, issues that uh, that was of concern take those. Um, so just in answer to um, the gate control uh, query, we don't have detail with regards to precisely how that would operate at the moment in terms of delivery trucks um, and actual general access arrangements. That would be something. We had a condition which we imposed on the previous application um, that we had here which approved that spine road. So just to confirm, this, is, this spine road was agreed as part of the pre previous Reserve Matters application. Uh, the gate control access would be somewhere in this location, but obviously now we've got the additional access here for the service yard. Uh, County Highways have said to ensure a 15 metre distance um, back for HGVs. But in terms of the actual how the gated control would access, we would deal with it that, by, that by the discharge condition, which would need to be addressed through the form previous application. So we'd get all that level of detail agreed with County Highways as part of that discharge condition request. Oh, sorry, I didn't know if we. Go on, Johnny, come back. Then. Chair, if I if I can come by back on that, uh, as we haven't got those details, can I propose that uh, once they come in, that's done in conjunction with the ward councillors, please. Yeah. yeah. Do the other questions. We can certainly, as part of that actual condition requirement, come back to you. It's not, we've had conditions previously that have had reference to consultation with members or parish within the actual wording of the condition. We can't amend that now because that's already in the former application condition wording, but um, we can make a note um, to, to come back to uh, all members when it comes to discharging that condition. And in relation to the parking for the staff and visitors to the north, so yes, that would be staff and visitor parking within that area um, that would be provided for there. With regards to the actual colour of the cladding, yes, I think 
county urban design their concerns were that normally on that kind of edge they wanted it to try and sort of blend in with the more rural environment so perhaps the colouring and the actual nature of the cladding and a more perhaps timber type appearance in material and colouring and um, would be perhaps what they'd be looking for um, but I think that has been considered as part of this application and we don't object um, as officers to what we've seen in terms of material palette that's come forward at the present time but we have got a condition that we've imposed anyway with regards to material detail to be agreed and we have got quite I mean whilst it is on the sort of edge here we have got sort of quite commercial units along here which um, don't use that kind of sort of natural palette so we've obviously taken that into consideration as officers when we've considered this application. Okay members um, as mentioned the recommendation for approval is on 6-1 with item 7 and 8 on the addendum um, we've mentioned the the information about what well, council has been made aware of the proposed uh, gating arrangements. Those members in favour of the approval, please indicate. Thank you. That item is approved. Next, we have item seven: new airport terminal building at South End Airport. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this application relates to the airport terminal building. Planning permission is being sought to vary condition to planning permission reference number 17, oblique 00996, oblique FUL, under section 73 of the Town and Country Plan Act 1990. Condition 2 relates to the previously approved plan numbers imposed on the original consent, which allowed extensions to the northern and southern end of the terminal building. The location planning front of you. Um, outlined in bold illustrates um, where the proposed extensions will be located. Um, in, in front of you, if, you, if you can see those elevations, it just shows the front elevation, the rear elevation, and both the nor northern and southern elevations of the building. Um, the variation being sought to the northern extension relates to a slight decrease in depth. The roof form would comprise a curved roof with a central area flat roof. This area flat roof would incorporate roof lights. The roof form would not be overtly visible from the highways. It's disguised by a parapet. Um, the operational baggage area, which is outlined in bold in front of you, would no longer be fully enclosed to the western edge of the extension. The main roof would project over this area and an aluminium mesh screen would uh, be erected along the western edge. This will segregate the operational baggage area from the return route area. The purpose for altering this area of the extension is due to further ground investigations established that foundations of the previously approved western elevation would impinge on the existing underground surface water attenuation tanks. Alterations are being made to the southern um, elevation. Uh, the southern extension is. Try and go a bit closer to the microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, the southern extension is proposed to be slightly enlarged and the roof uh, form altered to include a curved roof. Um, with areas of flat roof bordering, uh, this would uh, visually enhance that what was previously approved. Um, I've done a, a comparison plan, which, if you can see that, um, you can see that the changes proposed are minor. Uh, the design and form of these extensions would still mimic uh, the terminal building and therefore not considered to cause undue demonstrable harm. Um, as part of this application, it was also proposed to either discharge a number of conditions or vary the wording to suit the revisions to this scheme. The discharge and uh, revisions to the conditions are considered acceptable. The proposed development co complies with policies relevant to this application and has been recommended for approval subject to the revised conditions and with all other conditions to remain the same as originally imposed on, on application 17 oblique 00966 oblique FUL set out on page 7.1 um, of the agenda and onwards. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, Councillor Lucas Gill indicated. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have asked another councillor what this means, but uh, nobody seems to know. Condition 6, B R E A M. Can you explain what that is, Bream. please? Yeah, it's. Uh, it's the BREAM. Um, it tests um, how sustain uh, sustainable. There's a criteria that buildings must meet um, to provide a sustainable development, um, and the BREAM is is um, is a criteria that just sets out this, and that it must accord with with that. Um, we've got a policy in our local plan that refers to the um, BREAM assessment, um, and the BREAM of the actual building has been assessed if it goes ahead as good. Um, we have a standard that it must be good or very good. Um, and that's, that's what it refers to, the sustainability of that, of that building. What do the initial stand for, please? We'll inform you. Have you got it off the top of your head? I haven't got it off the no? top of my head. No, OK. Yeah. We'll put that as... Yeah. But not entirely relevant to, to determining the application, though. <coughs> but it, uh, it's about a, a, a sustain sustainability. All right, so re relatively uh, minor alterations in the gra in the grand scale of things and discharge of some conditions. Um, members, the recommendation for approval is printed on page 7.1 through to 7.4. Those members in favour of the approval, please indicate. Thank you. That item is approved. Right. Next, we move on to the first of our referred items from the weekly list, which is Rose Dean Nurseries, Barrow Hall Road, Barling Magna. Again, this is an item that has some information on the addendum. Given our problems with the IT, we're just going to making sure everything works each before we start each presentation. Yeah, in turn, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Good evening. Good evening, members. Is it on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So the application seeks permission to the principal only of development for 24 dwellings at a site in the Green Belt. I'd like to show you, so there we are, there's the site, site itself. So what we have to the south of the site is Barrow Hall Road and going to, to the left of the site is Barling Road. So currently the site, as you'll see members, there are two bungalows occupying the left-hand corner of the site. The remaining part of the site was a former nursery uh, area. Um, and I've got some photographs just to show members what the site is like currently, current day. So basically access, layout, design, siting and external appearance have been reserved for future judgment. So the only issue that we're looking at members this evening is the principle of development. I'm aware that there are some indicative elevation plans that have been submitted in support of the application, but they're indicative only. And the purpose of those, I think, is to indicate that at a future stage, should a principal consent be granted, they're just providing a flavour in terms of what may follow. I think what is quite clear from the linear development upon along uh, uh, Barling Road and Barrow Hall Road, it's a linear development form, isn't it? With dwellings facing the, the actual street, and then you've got a cluster of built form on that corner as well, haven't you, where Barling Road comes on to Barrow Hall Road. If we could move on to the next slide, please. So again, that's just it blown up. So what we have there is the, as members will note from the report, the site is unusual in a way because um, it basically follows the uh, boundary lines of four properties, which is Mareng, F is it F F uh, Fintree, Clematis and Fowey. So obviously the development is set out to one side of those properties the two bungalows to the left would be demolished then to make way for built form with the development of the remaining uh, site also. If we could move on to the next slide. Okay, so basically, <coughs> there we go. 
this shows, if I just get the pen, although it's a principled uh, consent that has been sought, there's a means of access proposed potentially. It's, it seeks to show where access could work. So there's one point of access here and an access road into the site comes round here and then comes back out here, the other side of uh, these properties here. So this is just, although even the layout is reserved, it is just the plan has, has sought to demonstrate how a development in principle may work within this site, taking into account the vehicle access that would be required to serve those dwellings. And what we can see clearly is that the area currently occupied by the by the two bungalows there are three dwellings facing Barling Road and the indicative plan at this stage at least shows that the car parking will be to the frontage of these three properties practically basically reversing onto Barling Road as a means of getting out further on and, and back up towards Rochford and, and uh, Shopton, etc. So that's just an indicative. So we must remember that this is indicative only, but it is helpful because the report, um, a part of the report does mention the quantum of development. So even at outline stage, um, it's helpful to know in terms of would it meet the principles of technical housing standards on garden areas, etc. Although that isn't the specific issue here. I think in principle we ha you know we've got a layout we're not saying we're not commenting on the layout because it's the, the design is reserved but that's just an indicative if we can move on please we'll move on past that thank you and and f yeah f and further on if we can do, do some photographs just to the next one so I'm aware that you'll be looking at some photographs later on anyway, but this is the junction of Barling Road with Barrow Hall Road, and that is one of the bungalows in which one of those three, three uh, dwellings I showed you on the plan would occupy. So they're quite well set back from the highway, actually, these two bungalows. And then the area remains open behind these bungalows. So we'll go on to the next photograph. So there we are, two bungalows sitting. And... Um, there is a hedgerow here that uh, to the boundary of the site, which is referred to um, by the arborist in terms of there are early beech tree specimens within this hedge. So it's um, you know it's quite uh, screened actually on that elevation. If we move on to the next photograph, please. Okay, so there we are. And in terms, of the purpose of showing you this photograph is in terms of the road network, the the western part, this part of the site, you can see there's a good boundary here. The road is quite narrow. As I've been walking along this road, what is clear is that there is a highway verge. Highway verge being an area of land, at least a metre from the edge of the actual vehicle carriageway is highway verge. Um, notwithstanding that this is only a, a principled uh, application for consent, um, there is some space between the road edge and actually the actual tree growth here, but it narrows down as we go along. If we can go on to the next uh, shot, please. So that's just looking down uh, Barling Road. And what I wanted to demonstrate here, there is a footpath com coming down here, but obviously there isn't a footpath along Barrow Hall Road. Move on to the next photograph. Thank you. And that's just a shot looking up towards um, Shopton. Is it Shopton Road? Is it up towards Rochford and South End? We'll move on. And there, there we go. So you're gonna. I'm aware. Perhaps you'll be looking at this road network. What, what, what is in terms of not particularly. Um, I just don't want to dwell on it too much. But what actually I've noted from the site visits is that the the white line in terms of road actually doesn't seem to demark it's not running along the middle of the actual carriageway which may give rise to problems but we'll move on i just want to show you a few more photographs so that is a shot of of the bungalow looking through the hedge so you can see that they're quite set back within their own grounds can I have the next one please We'll, we'll move on from that one. Just want to. So here we go. These are the other dwelling houses I mentioned then, Fawi, Mareng, Clematis. And then the access actually would come out the, the, the well, 
the indicative axis at this point, it's not definitive, would come out in this area here, beyond, so that's the upper proposed indicative axis. So we'll just, I've just got a few more photographs to show you members. And that's just, just to demonstrate that at that centre of that indicative axis, the road is very straight. Uh, I don't wish to comment any more than that on that. Right, so in terms of the characteristics of a site, I think this is key, actually, in terms of that we know that the, the characteristics of the green belt is, is the very essence of what green belt policy is trying to safeguard. Um, and this is a shot just taken to the west or the left-hand side of the, of the cluster of houses looking into the site. So the bungalows that we looked at earlier, they're, they're more down here. So that gives you an idea of what the site is like now. It's quite open and devoid of any built form. So we'll just move on. And that is uh, another shot looking head on into the site. And then we've got this boundary here. So it's, so it's quite a sort of sizable site, it's obviously not point 91 hectares so that relates to um, 9,000 square meters so hectares are 10,000 square meters so about 9,000 square meters in total we'll just move on and wrap up on these photographs and that's another shot just looking through into the field so what we're looking at here members are the the tops of the roofs of the houses along Barling Road here We'll just move on. I think I'm almost concluded on my photographs. And that is a photograph taken from uh, the hedge in between the two bungalows at the western end of the site, so looking up into the site. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how it looks as of this week, really, and that's how it's been. It's quite open and devoid of any, of any built form. So just the last photograph... And that's just a, another close-up. So what we have is there is a little bit of undergrowth and sort of shrubbery and trees growing on site. So I'd just like to, thank you very much for that, I'd just like to uh, just pinpoint the key points in the report. Um, there are three considerations in paragraph 12 of the report. Um, paragraph 14 in terms of the the greater impact on openness of a green belt than the existing development. So. Members will note from the report that there's two elements to this, is that where the, the bungalows occupy, that could feasibly be, be considered as previously developed land. Now, I think members will appreciate from the report the uh, relevance of the previously develop, developed land consideration. And the glossary of the National Planning Policy Framework, which you have here, sets out the, the definition of previously developed land. And the conclusions in the report is, other than the, the site of the two bungalows occupy, it doesn't qualify under previously developed land, because the land, as far as the local planning authority is concerned, otherwise was used as a nursery for propagating for growing plants, and agricultural land, as defined by section 336 of the Town and Country Planning Act, is not... Uh, does not come under previously developed land. So as a matter of the default position, this is inappropriate development in the green belt. Given that the built form within that 0.91 hectare site would actually um, develop that site, the built form would be greater than the massing of the built form within the site currently, and hence it would be inappropriate, and it would be, again, it would be contrary to policy. Just to conclude then, In terms of the, yeah, the, the paragraph 22 describes the essential characteristics and the, the greater impact on the openness of a green belt, and that is also a key consideration. And as this development would have a greater impact, then the default position is that it, it's, it would be contrary to policy. So the conclusions that we've reached that, that, that it would be an appropriate development, I'd like to just point out as well is that members may be aware, just in passing, that there are, have been a couple of appeal decisions on a site which is, forms part of the curtilage of one of the... It's just to the... Where members, I showed you a straight road where the potential access could be to the site and, 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 and exit, there was an appeal decision 
there were two applications and two appeal decisions for in respect of residential development on a site that actually where the access comes out it's it's part of this development site and i think what i'm referring to there is is that consistent for many years now the green belt policy exists to safeguard green belt from development and consistent with the the previous application for a smaller scale residential development on part of this site is that there's a consistent approach the policies in respect of green belt development have not changed and therefore the policy position hasn't changed i'd just like to finish off by indicating that we're aware of the consultation responses we're aware that there were many representations of concerned of concerns received from the public particularly in relation to highways and also Sutton Parish Council commented notwithstanding the green belt issue just to conclude the flood the areas in a flood zone one so the flood risk is relatively low but there is a currently a holding objection from lead local from the lead local flood authority vehicle access although indicative only um, we have had a response from Essex Highways as as included in the addendum although I don't think that basically the conditions suggested would be something for consideration at this stage because of the it would be a subject at reserve matters but perhaps it is appropriate to when we look at quantum of development perhaps it is appropriate to consider to a degree the the principle of highway access as it is in terms of the principle of flooding so there's a holding objection and there's also an whole, there's a, an ecology uh, objection from the the county ecologist and also on a tree on the tree survey that would be required so culminating in four reasons for the recommendation to refuse this application thank you thank you I have a speaker on this one, Councillor Cohen from Barling Magna Parish Council. Thank you. There are many objections to this proposal and it is not possible to do justice to those objections in five minutes. Those objections include, but not exclusively, the erosion of the greenbelt, health and safety issues, an increase in the flood risk, overloading the sewage capacity, overburdening the utilities, increasing road traffic, increasing car emissions, increasing street parking, insufficient infrastructure with pressure on schools, doctors and country roads, the loss of privacy to existing residents, increased noise pollution, no account whatsoever of the impact on the local wildlife and habitat, destruction of the amazing open vistas and skies around Barling, inappropriate development, out of character with the area and street scene, setting a precedent for further development. I will try and address a few of the points. We are all mindful of the pressures upon the District Council to allow planning applications for more housing, but this scheme is beyond reasonable. This is a proposal for 24 three-bedroom houses to be built in the main on Greenbelt in a rural setting with proposed exits onto a narrow, hazardous country road with extremely limited visibility. Greenbelts were introduced to prevent intrusion onto the countryside. Tom Fiennes of the Campaign to Protect Rural England is reported as saying we are being sold a lie by many developers as they sell off and gobble up the greenbelt to build low density, unaffordable housing. Young families go on struggling to afford a place to live. The affordable housing crisis must be addressed with increasing urgency whilst acknowledging that far from providing the solution, building on greenbelt only serves to entrench the issue. He went on to express concern that greenbelt is being eroded at an alarming rate. I would like to make a brief reference to the case of Fox Land and Property Limited, who had been refused planning permission by Castle Point Borough Council to develop Greenbelt land off Liebland Thundersley, but where a residential development of up to 165 dwellings. The inspectorate had re recommended that the appeal by Fox Land be allowed and planning permission be granted, 
but the Secretary of State disagreed with this recommendation. In dismissing the appeal and refusing planning permission, the Secretary of State concluded that the proposals were an inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. He identified harm to the Greenbelt's openness and harm to the Greenbelt's purpose of preventing urban spread, preventing encroachment on the countryside and preventing the merging of neighbouring settlements and harm to Greenbelt's character and appearance. This represented a considerable harm to which he attributed substantial weight. The Secretary of State was concerned that a decision to allow this appeal for housing in the Greenbelt risked setting an undesirable precedent for similar developments which would seriously undermine national Greenbelt policy. At a Conservative estimate, 24 houses means the likelihood of at least 48 cars, if not more. Barrow Hall Road is narrow, with few passing places for larger vehicles. There is no pavement, nor realistically, realistically room for one. The traffic speeds into Barrow Hall, head on into a na narrow, dangerous bend, and this is where it's proposed to access the site, on a dangerous, blind bend. There are serious concerns at the anticipated increase in traffic using Barrow Hall, arising from the 320 anticipated dwellings in Star Lane and the planned 120 <coughs> dwellings at the Little Wakering end of Barrow Hall Road, with sole access to this site being in Barrow Hall Road. In reality, there is no safe siting for an entrance to this proposed development. There are no shops, no schools in the hamlet. There is no employment in the immediate vicinity. More houses means more traffic on country lanes, including Shopland Road, a notorious accident hotspot. Barling is favoured by walkers, horse riders and most definitely by cyclists. Increased traffic will increase the risk of accidents and injuries to these groups. The reference to a wet ditch is Mucking Brook, which is an important main watercourse, taking drain water from the South Church side of South End. In times of heavy rain, this waterway has overflowed and Barling Road has become almost impassable. Downpours result in flooding at the junction of Barling Road and Barrow Hall. The current systems are not coping, and this before the added Just burden of further 24 houses to an already stretched drainage system, exacerbated by the impact of building on land, which would otherwise absorb the rainwater to offset the flooding risks. The developers claim that this development will enhance local character is fiction. It is in stark contrast to the nearby listed cottages and will forever ruin the appearance of a pretty and appealing hamlet. The developers claim to enhance and maintain the vitality of this already existing rural community cannot be achieved by introducing 24 houses with associated cars, traffic, noise, pollution and loss of privacy by adjacent properties. 40 or more residents of this parish felt strongly enough to take the trouble to log their view onto the District Council's planning comment page. This illustrates the strength of feeling within the community. They do not want an inappropriate and overdevelopment of their hamlet. I would urge that their views are given weight. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it is they who will pay the price for this overdevelopment and they should not be treated shabbily. Do we really want to deny future generations any rural countryside around South End and Rochford? Will this be our legacy to destroy what is left of our greenbelt and rural life? I sincerely hope not. Do not betray your residents by allowing this unacceptable proposal. Okay. <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, Councillor Stanley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it would, it would look to be that uh, 20, 26 houses in, in a small hamlet of under 26 houses would be overpowering to the hamlet in itself. Apart from the um, surface water management, which uh, would, would indicate that uh, it's already been indicated that it, it does flood around those areas, um, it's, it's just an inappropriate uh, development, especially in the Green Belt. Um, I feel that. Uh, Yes, they can perhaps put another building uh, where the other two bungalows are, make it three, um, but that's, that's only one, uh, uh, one more than what is already there. I do feel that the, uh, the, the way it's designed as to drive in and out is really, really very dangerous to the, to the corner uh, where vehicles will actually sort of come off the corner if they don't watch out they'll be colliding into vehicles coming out of that area so um yeah i'm i'm not at all happy with this development at all thank you thank you councillor septo thank you chairman um whilst uh, officers are loading up my photographs um i've called this in some time ago uh, mainly because of the lack of reports from various uh, consultancy bodies 
uh, in particular Education, Essex, uh, the Environment Agency, and in particular the highways. The application should have come before this committee at the last committee meeting, but for one reason or another it was missed off the agenda. I find it very strange that two days before the week at it before our committee that we get an addendum listing the issues around highways. I find that a little strange and uh, I will be questioning that further at highways. With regards to the presentation, um, I feel that the committee has been slightly uh, misled and I'll explain why. First of all, uh, the picture I show you there, I'd like you to take note of the telegraph pole that has got the transformer on. Just make a mental note of that please. If I could have picture two, please. This is where I'm standing by the side of that telegraph pole, which is where the second entrance and the main entrance to the site is, that wasn't mentioned earlier on, and I'm having to stand right on the edge of the road to be able to see around the corner. Can you imagine what a car would be like to come out at that point? And again, please notice that there is very little markings on that road there. Again, picture three, please. You'll notice I've had to walk down to that white wall before I can see round that corner, and you can just see the main junction that, the main junction there, which is Barling Road, which is the main roadway that comes through. Although the traffic is filtered into this road, the actual main road runs down in, in this picture to the right. Um, picture four, please. Please note, that vehicle is just standing roughly where that telegraph pole is. You can just see the telegraph pole coming out the top of the hedge. And you can see the width of the road. It's not wide enough for two cars to pass at that particular point. And just in front, to the right of that vehicle, you can see the entrance, not the one in the foreground, the, the one further back in the picture. That is the existing entrance to the site, and that is where the main entrance on the plan is not as suggested in the presentation further up the road. Picture five, please. This is a car going in the opposite direction, again, to just give you an indication of the width of the road. You, you can see there how narrow that particular road is. Picture six, please. Again, you can see the vehicle move down very slightly, and again, you can see how, long the road, how narrow the road is. Also notice the slow sign that covers more than half the width of the road. Again, that's the standard slow sign, and it shows you the width of the road. And note, there are no center white line there because the road is simply not wide enough to put it. Picture seven, please. This is, as you can see, where the bungalows are, and this is looking up to the main site there. The road there is, is over, the hedge is overhanging. Uh, although the officer suggested there is a piece of highway along that edge, it isn't maintained by highways as part of the contract, um, so there is currently no footpath there, and to walk around that corner in either side of the road is a very dangerous corner. Picture eight, please. Uh, sorry, if we can have it the other way up, would be very helpful. <laughs> That's it. Um, this is a note, a picture of me driving the car. Please note that I wasn't taking the picture, my passenger was laid it across taking it, so I don't get in trouble with using a mobile phone. You can just see where that telegraph pole is, just in the middle of the uh, pit, almost in the middle of the picture there, and you can see how far I've had to come forward before I can even see where that entrance is. That telegraph pole, even if you remove the hedge, will still remain in the way. I would like to suggest and propose that a number of additional reasons for refusal are added to the uh, um, the paper. With regards to the roads there, the roads are very narrow. There has been no allowance for putting any additional footpath in. Moving that telegraph pole, and I know it's going to be difficult to move that because it's got the main power unit in there, and that does feed all of the properties in that area. So that's going to be a difficult job, I do appreciate. With 24 potential houses, there's going to be quite a considerable number of people wanting to go to school. The bus stop, you would have to revert, walk back behind where the car is in that picture there. A fair distance round, round the roads where there are no footpaths to the bus stop. I would suggest 
that we need to put on in there that the bus stop is relocated into the Barling Road where there is currently a footpath and that would be far more sensible a much safer place for buses to, to go. The buses don't actually come down Barling, uh, Barrow Hall Road there, they come down Barling Road. So, and I'd also like to see uh, a contribution towards education because there is going to be an additional cost for the buses, etc., etc. The junior school, incidentally, is some considerable distance away, two, two and a half miles. Um, and again, there will be a need for looking after the children there. With regards to the water runoff of the site, it is downhill from this, this point behind the car. It's quite a steep slope and it does run quite quickly. It runs to the water course that was mentioned by the uh, Chairman of the Barling Parish Council. It is the main water course. It is monitored by the Environmental Agency and I'm surprised that they haven't commented on this. It does take the main water feed out from the whole of South Church in South End, comes down through our district and it does flood quite frequently. There is a property just round the corner there fairly recently where the water ran over the road and the water was running in the front door and out the back door, which is not the most pleasant thing in the world. So that needs to be taken into account and I would want to see something on there with regards to uh, attenuation tanks control of how that water is let into the, into the stream. Chairman, I would like to propose all of those things, and some of the wording may have to be uh, um, uh, uh, work with the officers. And I would also like to include all of the points that have been raised by highways in the addendum that they should be included within the in the re, re, in the report, because currently they are not. And uh, that also includes the import formatives. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Before before we move on. Um, I think we've got a few issues with some of the things that you've you've mentioned because what we're looking at here is the principle of whether development should take place everything else is then reserved the principle of whether highway access is possible everything else is then reserved so to be talking about water attenuation tanks or on site I'd, it's just not appropriate at this moment if you look to point two on the officer recommendation for refusal, um, the, the, there's clearly a point there that describes how there is no effective surface water drainage strategy. And that's, I, I believe that is the appropriate level that we will be working at for this, for the nature of this application, which is principle with all matters reserved. So, yeah. Would you like to yeah. come in at th that point? Um, yeah, can I? Oh, I might need the pointing thing. So for the first one, um, the the roads and the highways um, access is not for determination. So the specific access points um, onto the the highway, we we can't reasonably put a reason for refusal together in relation to the the roads being narrow in relation to the vicinity of the site um, is. It, well, it hasn't formed a reason for refusal for, from an officer perspective because county um, highways believe that in principle an access point can be delivered onto the highway um, that is safe and it is a maintained highway albeit with pinch points at certain points um, but it operates with road traffic on it at the moment and they would not support a reason for refusal around the highway that would serve the site um, not being acceptable and so detrimental to highway safety that it should be refused. Um, the MPPF talks about reasons for refusal in relation to highway where highway impacts are severe. So the difficulty we would have there is that the highways authority wouldn't support that reason for refusal. Um, in relation to the, the road being narrow and the footpath um, and the considerable number of people that are using um, the site um, because of the number of the quantum of development that's proposed and the f um, f 
journey on foot to the bus stop not being ideal, I think we could potentially work those elements into reason for refusal one, which relates, which does reference, although it's mainly concerning the green belt, it references the site not being um, uh, a sustainable development, um, being located in a rural area, not part of an existing residential settlement. So I think those elements of, you know, the, the, the sort of journey to the bus stop not being served by um, a proper footway um, and the other couple of points I just mentioned we could perhaps work those into reason for refusal one and it support that reason um, we in relation to specifically the bus stop being relocated um, I think at this stage we are as officers looking for well we're recommending refusal on quite you know four grounds that are you know pretty well substantiated and I think the bus stop, the proximity to the site and the, the not the footway being not being acceptable is probably as far as we can go. Um, we're not really looking for this development to get approval. Um, we would be confident at an appeal that an inspector would um, kind of go with our, our reasoning. Um, and on that, the bus stop being relocated is therefore perhaps something that you'd look for if we were actually going to get, uh, we're looking for approval. Um, so I would say perhaps not necessary to be dealt with at this stage or work into a reason for refusal. County Education were, con were consulted on the application um, and haven't requested any contribution. So that leaves us in a difficult situation in terms of putting a reason for refusal together around the lack of an education contribution because we haven't been told by the authority responsible for school provision in the district that that's necessary and reasonable coming from this development. So we might have a view on that response or lack of a response, but we would it would be very difficult for us as the local authority not responsible for education provision to formulate uh, an argument um, robustly at appeal because the inspector would, would want that put robustly that we could ask for that here so again I don't think on this occasion we could, we could look at that um, and then the flood risk I think is adequately dealt with in reason for refusal too so that does talk about the fact that the application hasn't demonstrated that the surface water can be effectively dealt with recognising the issues of um, flood risk at the site from surface water drainage. In principle, the land is flood zone one, so at the lowest level of flood risk, but we are still not satisfied that they've put together a surface water drainage strategy, even at the outline stage, that demonstrates um, they could, um, it wouldn't increase flood risk elsewhere. So I think that is all worked into that reason for refusal too. Okay. Having listened to the officers and yourself, Councillor Stepto, I think this is, the, the the crux of what and the bonk of what you were saying was around highways so I think it's for you to determine whether you want to push on the highways reasons that you, you, you mentioned knowing that county highways are unlikely to support at this point Please. Chair if I may come back <coughs> um, I think there's a number of items there that could go forward as an informative because um, this, the nature of this particular site I don't think this will be the last time we see it. Yeah. Uh, with regards to the highways issues, I'm curious to ask officers, had the highways responded at an early stage, earlier stage in the process, would any of these items be then taken forward to reasons for refusal? Um, so I think we can um, note down for you know for, for information and for any further application the points that were raised and certainly we can work in a couple of the items I mentioned in respect of condition uh, reason for refusal mm -hmm. one to support that yeah. the fact that we don't consider it a sustainable location um, but you know the, the sort of um, sort of rather late response from county highways is is not ideal but in this situation it wouldn't change officers view in that um, because the site is served by a highway um, an adopted highway it's not a you know a track it's um, it, it takes vehicular traffic from the surroundings okay this would increase the amount of vehicle traffic using that particular location but an access could be provided um, that was safe um, and so county wouldn't support that reason for refusal so it, the timing of that response being received hasn't changed ha, has had no impact on how officers would view that okay. 
uh, then I would like to see them go forward, the items to go forward as an informative, because as I've said, yeah. this is not going to be the last time we see this application. Okay. It's going to come bouncing backwards and forwards to us for some considerable Thank time, you. I believe. Mm -hmm. Councillor Hockway. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to uh, <coughs> concur with uh, many of the points raised by Councillor Steptoe. Um, I just would like for clarity, because we, we've got the indicative um, map up there, just to um, point out what I believe was a mistake in the original <coughs> report. Um, as I see it on that, uh, that drawer in there, the, the access point is um, to, the, uh, to the west of the, uh, the properties that were mentioned, the four properties. Um, and in the uh, presentation, uh, the officer showed that uh, the, uh, the, the, the preferred access point was actually uh, in the photographs, which was indicating it was to the east. Um, so, um, yes, it's, uh, it's actually nearer to the, uh, uh, the, the, the more dangerous as aspect of the, uh, the, the road there, uh, nearer to the bend. Um, and I think uh, Councillor Steptoe's uh, photographs um, and his description demonstrate that. Um, this <coughs> raises the, the issue <coughs> where um, <coughs> I do have to wonder what planet county highways are on. You couldn't find a more um, dangerous uh, um, access point onto a highway um, and this is my opinion not just as uh, a, a councillor but also as a licensed taxi driver who regularly uses this route and has to um, come across vehicles coming in both directions where individuals do have to give way to each other because of the, uh, the insufficient uh, width of the carriageway there. It may be an existing um, uh, carriageway but I would imagine if there was anything that was likely to be built there um, you know, from scratch, it would never be built to the conditions that w that we we uh, that that exist presently, um, and uh, I think that um, that it does need to be uh, raised. And I, I, I back the informatives that Councillor Stepto has, has, has raised that this this does need to be <coughs> in uh, uh, our, our our report so that any f any future applications that come forward that there's a background to this. Yep. Thank okay. you. Councillor Griffin. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, could we go back to the diagram that shows the two bungalows, uh, the original one that we looked at? Um, just behind the four bungalows in a row on the uh, nursery site, there's a number of rectangles and squares. Um, what were they or what are they today? Here. Yes. Mm. Greenhouse. Greenhouse. Go on, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, there's what were they in, his, in, in historic times? There were former glass houses uh, growing, propagating sheds, but there's absolutely nothing there now. They're all demolished now. That's right. Thank you. Okay. That's Lucas Gale. Sorry, Chairman, thank you. Um, following on from Councillor Steptoe's comments, did Essex County actually come and survey the site or have they relied on maps? Well, I have, we haven't asked the specific question, uh, unless I know otherwise. So uh, my understanding is they visit sites on which they provide um, consultation responses on, much the same way that officers would visit a site where they are recommending a determination for a planning application. Um, but the short answer in this particular situation is I haven't asked that specific question of them. I suppose I presume that they do visit every site. Okay, members, we have um, a recommendation for refusal printed on 8.1.17 and 8.1.18 
which would have a series of informatives added to it and some further working into item one around the sustainable development reason for refusal. So those members in favour of the refusal as indicated plus the informatives as outlined by Councillor Steptoe and the adjustment to item one as outlined by the officers, please indicate. That item is fully refused. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Our next item is item 8.2, Bramblehurst Farm, Hydewood Lane, Canewden. If any of our visitors wish to go at this point, feel free, but it's going to be really exciting the rest of the meeting. <laughs> Sorry, Chairman, um, so I'm not very close to that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, the, this application relates to the site outlined um, in bold here with access um, off Hydywood Lane. If I can take you to the next um, the layout plan, please. So the application site um, is this area here and relates to the replacement of an existing mobile home um, and the erection of a dwelling house in its place. Um, the proposal, um, the existing mobile home is positioned here on the site and this proposal seeks to remove that from the site and erect the new dwelling house in the same position um, within the plot. The existing mobile home um, has been granted a lawful development certificate um, through passage of time. So it's an application that, that benefits from um, a lawful development certificate rather than granted planning permission in the first instance. It has been there for a considerable length of time, um, so not perhaps exact th the same mobile home because you can replace them, it's a use of land, but the use for the stationing of a mobile home for residential use has been going on for some perhaps 36 years. The key, if I can take you to the next plans, I can show you um, the proposed bungalow, sorry they're quite faint, but the bungalow that's proposed to replace the mobile home um, has a rectangular footprint, um, a simple pitch roof form, a small porch detail um, over the door. The key issue for the determination of this application lies in the fact that the application site is in the green belt and that in planning terms the mobile home that currently exists is defined as a caravan, um, so it under the Caravan Sites Act, rather than being considered in planning terms a dwelling house. It's a use of land for the stationing of a mobile home for residential purposes that benefits from the Lawful Development Certificate. And what's proposed is operational development. It's bricks and mortar with foundations, and that would be considered a dwelling house. So we go to the MPPF in terms of what is acceptable development in the green belt, and the replacement of um, a mobile home with a bricks and mortar dwelling house, which is considered operational development, is considered inappropriate development in the green belt, which should only be allowed if very special circumstances exist, which clearly outweigh the harm. The harm in this case, so in terms of harm to green belt openness, we think of the scale of development. So that's the development's height, its width, its length, but also particularly pertinent in this example is the degree of permanence. So that is also a factor when you're considering the, um, the harm in terms of greenbelt openness. This replacement dwelling is not, not, not greatly excessive in terms of its scale. 
in terms of its height, its width, its length. It's 9% greater in floor area than the mobile home which it would replace. But officers take the degree of permanence to mean that in this particular situation, there would be increased harm arising from the building of a dwelling, a bungalow, um, as opposed to the positioning on the site of a mobile home, which could be moved from the site, albeit we accept that this one has been in situ for 36 years. Um, the applicants have submitted some um, extenuating circumstances which relate to the um, medical um, conditions of the <coughs> current occupier. Um, whilst, the, whilst officers sympathise with these, very special circumstances, by their definition, have to be very special. And the fact in this instance is that the mobile home, which I think is a, a, little, a little old in this particular um, case, could be replaced by another mobile home and overcome some of the issues that are affecting the health of the, the lady that occupies um, the, the mobile home. So officers have concluded that the proposal would amount to inappropriate development in the green belt in which there are no very special circumstances to outweigh the harm and the recommendation therefore chairman is one of refusal. Thank you. We have a speaker on this one, Ms Jennings. minutes I'll let you know when you've got a minute to go. Thank you chairman. My name's Kate Jennings of Whirlage and Not and I'm the agent for the applicant. Uh, the applicant Mrs Buckingham has been residing on the site at Bramblehurst Farm since 1982 when the pig enterprise was first established. Planning permission was also obtained at this time. That was the first time that planning permission was obtained for the mobile home on this site. Um, the mobile home on the site has been in situ in the same spot um, but it was replaced in 1995 after a fire but throughout this time it's been Mrs Buckingham's home. The agricultural activity on the farm ceased in 2001 following the pressures from the general decline in pig prices leading to the loss of a contract and then the outbreak of foot and mouth disease and very, very close to home meant that it was no longer viable to rear pigs on the site. Mrs Buckingham remained living on site and in 2017 a certificate of lawfulness was granted by RDC for the continued occupation of the mobile home. The original permission was a temporary permission tied to the agricultural use, um, but as I said, the agricultural use ceased uh, for reasons beyond her control. The proposal is seeking the replacement of the mobile home, which is now 22 years old, with a very modest sized dwelling. The benefits of the replacement will mean that insulation and energy efficiency measures can be put into place and improve the living standards for Mrs Buckingham and reduce her living costs. Mrs Buckingham is retired and also has health issues which do not benefit from the damp and drafty conditions she is currently residing in. And this application was supported by a letter from Mrs Buckingham's doctor who confirmed a permanent dwelling would be, would be much more beneficial to her health. We are in agreement with Rochester District Council officers that the mobile home is not a building by definition but it is a temporary structure, but it's a temporary structure that has permanent permission to be on site without any restriction. The council have confirmed that the current caravan can be replaced with a similar or larger caravan rather than allow a new bricks and mortar dwelling. The size of any replacement caravan in this situation is controlled by the Control of Caravans Act 1960 as amended by the Caravan Site 1968. Under this legislation, the maximum size a caravan can extend to is 136 square metres, with an overall volume limit of about 414 metres cubed. The proposed replacement dwelling has been kept very modest and as such represents a 47% reduction in floor space from the allowable limit of a replacement mobile home. This, in area terms, is 70 square metres less usable floor space proposed in the permanent bricks and mortar dwelling than the caravan that could be replaced without the need for any further planning permission. In terms of volume, a pitch roof is proposed to replace the flat roof to improve the appearance of the um, building, but even with this addition of volume, the proposal still falls 20% below the volume of the maximum size of the caravan that could go on this site. And that caravan could be sited permanently without any further permissions. It's our view that the design and appearance of the proposed dwelling versus an extended mobile unit, which is lawful, is a significant enhancement in the Greenbelt. 
It is noted that this application was supported with seven letters from immediate neighbours who considered the replacement with a permanent dwelling would be far more suitable and in keeping with the area. The residential curtilage associated with the mobile home at Bramblehurst Farm is long established and a dwelling has permission to be sited here permanently. Whilst it's understandable that the council want to control sporadic development, each case should be judged on its own merits and specific circumstances. This residential site is long established in the landscape and to assume that if no one chose to live in a mobile home that it would be cleared from the site and returned to a green field is not logical given the extensive landscaping around the site and its setting in the farmstead. So in summary, the main issues to consider are whether the proposed development has a greater impact on the openness of the green belt than the existed permitted permanent caravan or any successive replacement. It's our view that the fallback position is significantly more harmful to the green belt than our proposal. Secondly, whether the proposed modest dwelling enhances the appearance of the site and it's our view and the view of the neighbours that supported this application that this proposal does offer an enhancement. And finally, whether the particular personal circumstances and the history, the long history of occupation by Mrs Buckingham at Bramblehurst Farm amount to very special circumstances which enable the proposal to be exceptionally supported in the green belt. It's our view that these do amount to very special circumstances. We would therefore respectfully ask the members to support this proposal. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Councillor no. Stanley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we're having a lot of trouble uh, with this green belt uh, of, of what we've got at the moment, where we're allowing um, anyone, basically, to, to put a caravan on or a mobile home and what have you. And there are circum cir circum uh, cir circumstances where, where um, a building of, of this construction I is allowed. Um, and those, as the officers know, is with the travellers. Um, however, this, this, obviously this person needs probably updating her residence um, and by doing so, it could be that she could live a better life. However, in putting a building on Green Belt, which we do not approve of, um, construction wise only in special circumstances and unless these special circumstances are being, have been brought forward in the case of where we have traveller sites um, I don't think this is an approved thing to do thank you okay Councillor Arno you preferred this one Chairman can I come back later in the dis after the discussion I think you are the discussion no the after the members discussion oh right okay Councillor Weston yes um, chairman just a couple of questions first of all uh, I understand there was in some of the report there's an um, Watchford District Council did an unlawful site in the caravan and then somewhere along the line a few years down the line it was a lawful can you just go through that again with me please thank you Um, I don't know if it helps, but if you refer to page um, 8.2.4 at the bottom of your um, committee papers, and then paragraphs labelled 7 to 12, that sets out the relevant planning history. So I'm not sure whether that, that sort of helps and answers your question, um, but we're dating back to sort of 1982 when we first looked at the siting of a mobile home for an agricultural worker. We then go into 84, renewing that permission. Um, it's then approved in 1996, subject to a condition, um, and then in 19, uh, sorry, 2017, um, the lawful development certificate was granted for the existing use for the siting of a mobile home for residential purposes. Uh, when that was when that was um, approved, was that because the it was in the area was used as a working area, or was it because the there was no more working on, on the farm itself and that was just the only thing that was on there was the mobile home, please. So in 2017, the lawful development certificate that was approved um, was re approved on the basis um, that the, the use for the siting of the mobile home and its residential occupation had been um, 
demonstrated by evidence from the applicant that it had been going on for 10 years on a continuous basis. So that is one of the grounds on which you can apply for a lawful development certificate. And it was um, demonstrated with evidence that that use for 10 years had been going on continually um, for a person living in that mobile home that was not last employed or connected with agriculture. So the, con the, the lawful development certificate that exists enables it, the caravan, the mobile home, to be used by anybody um, as a, you know, for residential purposes. It's not tied to any specific person um, and it's not tied to anybody last employed or employed in agriculture at the moment. Okay. Councillor Hockway. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <coughs> A statement there that um, each uh, application should be looked on on its own merits is something that I, uh, I, I agree with and approve. Um, so, <coughs> and uh, there obviously um, are some special circumstances relating to this particular uh, application. However, um, we are all aware that um, developers like to use um, precedents to uh, attempt to chip away at um, our policies and uh, the green belt um, and I uh, despite the circumstances that have been put forward I do agree with what the officers have laid out for the reasoning why they have refused this uh, particular application um, the uh, the individual still has the right uh, to uh, to, re to remain living on the site and has the option of uh, um, updating her residence um, but uh, the actual um, to change that to provide a permanent uh, dwelling as described by the offices I think goes against uh, the Greenbelt policy and I'm opposed to that. Thank you. Councillor Arno then. Chairman, uh, members, officers. Uh, this application comes from Mrs. Buck uh, Buckingham, who has lived at uh, Bramble House, Bramahurst Farm in a mobile home since 1982, when the pig enterprise on this uh, holding was first established. She has ridden through the ups and downs of the pig industry and a fire which gutted her house in 1985 and was, the, uh, was only to be forced to, uh, uh, to close her pig enterprise at Bramleyhurst Farm due to the poor market conditions and also ultimately the outbreak of the foot and mouth disease in 2001. Mrs Buckingham has resided in the same home on site since 1996 and planning permission exists on site to live in a home, mobile home, permanently in this location. However, the mobile home is in need of replacement and due to Mrs Buckingham's age and health issues, she is seeking to replace this old mo mobile home with an energy efficient and warm dwelling of a very modest size. The council have acknowledged that the mobile home can be replaced with a much larger property that exists on site and indeed a much larger mobile home than the dwelling proposed under this application. Mm. Could we uh, uh, could be placed on the site without any further planning consent? Such a replacement mobile home could be significantly more intrusive than the modest dwelling proposed. The replacement dwelling being sought is designed to the smaller standards, that is a three bedroom dwelling can be built to so it clears th clear that Mrs Buckingham is not seeking to build an extra uh, tra oh, extra travelant home in this uh, location. She is simply seeking to improve the quality of the dwelling on this site to benefit her health and stay at home over, th over 30 years. A doctor's letter has been submitted in support of the replacement of this stamp and Dr uh, droughty dwelling with a new dwelling and the benefits this could have to Mrs Buckingham's health. The very special circumstances that exist in this particular case are in my sufficient, uh, in, my, in my view, is sufficient to support the development within the Green Belt. 
In conclusion, Chairman, as we have heard, the proposed dwelling is significantly smaller than the fallback position, which is the placement of the mobile home with a substantially larger ho mobile home. The proposed development is some 20% some smaller than the bulk and mass that can be lawfully pulled onto site in the form of a mobile dwelling. The replacement with a smaller dwelling will have a much less impact on the Greenbelt and further development can be controlled by the removal of permitted development rights. The residential curtage is established and lawful on this site. This, is, this proposal does not extend beyond these established boundaries, so there is no impact on the openness of the green belt in this location. Thank you. I think this is a, a really finely balanced one for, for, from my side of things. Um, certainly the principle of someone living there, that, that, that's established. It's what they're going to be living in. There's no question that this particular property is ready for replacement. We do have to be very careful about precedent and the, the potential impact of that around the district. I think there are some special circumstances here that protect us from precedent being, uh, be, being used if we were to, to allow this, in that the, the length of time that um, this, this site has been used for residential accommodation clearly demonstrated is, is very significant and without question this is the, the this is a, a modest property just a I think it's nine percent bigger than what's already there um, but on the other hand people are talking about mobile homes as if they're a substandard product nowadays mobile homes do meet current energy standards they have to um, their their lifespan is, is is in excess of 40 years um, they they are very good very expensive products um, and, and it's quite true that a, a very much larger one could go on this site than the the actual proposal that's that's before us but members it is for us to use our judgment to make a decision so at this moment in time the reason for refusal is printed on page 8.2.11 which is a refusal in terms of green belt and it is a, 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 a balanced judgment that our officers have come to and, and supported. So uh, we, we need to take a vote on this one. So those members in favour of the refusal as printed on 8.2.11, please indicate. Those members against the approval. Right. I'm abstaining on that one. So that item is not refused. So, Councillor Yarno, yes. would you like to make uh, an alternative proposal? My alternative proposal would be that we apply PD rights, we remove the PD rights on the existing dwelling, but keep the, uh, uh, the footprint in place. It, as part of a motion for approval. Can I ask officers if they've got any other conditions that they, they would suggest to you? Don't know why that's um, yes, so um, if, the, if members um, are looking for a motion to approve the application, officers would suggest um, some standard conditions and also some conditions that would satisfy um, some aspects of, of Council's policy with relation to development in the green belt. Um, so there, we, we would um, seek to ask you to consider the standard time um, condition. Um, that's statutory requirements on any application. Um, another standard one that we um, build in accordance with the um, approved plans. That's standard. Um, 
that the materials and finish is agreed. Um, that's a pretty standard materials condition. Um, that we provide two parking spaces on the site in perpetuity, again, for any residential dwelling, that, that would be a requirement, and it's not something that I don't think they can achieve. Um, and then the council's green belt policy in terms, in terms of um, dwellings looks to remove permitted development rights for extensions um, and also for outbuildings um, and finally in this spe specific circumstance we would consider it um, pertinent to put a condition on requiring the removal of the existing mobile home from the site in its entirety um, which suggested within three months um, of the um, occupation or final construction of the new dwelling um, that's mm. just to avoid essentially a situation where you have both because they might want to just move it slightly to begin with so that they can they're, they're building in the same position on the site so okay. somewhere to live thank you yeah oh yeah, Sorry. Uh, yeah. with regards to the three months uh, period to remove the uh, the uh, dwelling uh, could that be extended because whether the three months will be sufficient to remove the dwelling it can be, yeah. I mean, it's not set in stone. It's something that um, we make a judgment about. I think three months is sort of a standard that we might apply, but if you wanted to suggest a, an alternative time frame, um, I guess it, the, the reason for the condition is for the interest of the openness of the green belt. So what you wouldn't want is too long a period, but something that's um, reasonable. Yeah. Uh, w uh, would the officers uh, agree to six months? What do you think, six months? It is, yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, we're saying three months from first occupation of the dwelling house. So essentially, you've, you've, yeah. you've got your dwelling house constructed, yeah? So we're not saying from, from first, you know, mm -hmm. digging in the, sa in, in the ground. Um, so okay, you've essentially yeah. got the dwelling house built and ready to occupy, and then we're saying all they need to do is arrange for it to the mobile home to be removed. Could I just ask, did you have a seconder for that I'll motion? Second yeah, that's seconded. Okay, Councillor Wilson. Hey, Chair, could I ask the officers, um, given that the resident in the mobile home um, is, has got permission to live there, is that granted to them personally, or is it to the site? It's a site. It's a, it's a site. The site. It's a site, yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, one last um, point, I think. Um, I think um, officers would need to be clear about the, if there is a motion to approve what the very special circumstances um, are because that would need to be put onto any um, decision that we issue um, if that motion were carried. Elaborate. Please. Uh, the very uh, the circumstance will be uh, Mrs. Buckingham's health, as uh, with evidence from her doctors, and the sustainability of uh, the non-sustainability of the existing dwelling. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So that we have a motion for approval with the conditions outlined by the officers put forward by. Councillor Iano, second by, by Councillor, Mr Shaw. Go on then. Thank you, Chairman. Can I just ask the officers if they feel that, that those um, reasons are um, appropriate? What, all I would add, probably, that there's been a lot of discussion um, and that... Um, you know, the discussion has um, touched on the fact that this particular mobile home has been on the site for 30 plus years um, and the, the length of time um, in this particular case might be different perhaps to other mobile homes that we have in the district where we might be concerned that a precedent might be set. Um, and the, So the very special, very special circumstances by definition need to be very special. So it would be perhaps pertinent to draw on anything you considered in this application to be um, unusually, you know, unusual, different to other situations that might be constitute very special. So I don't know if you want, if you want to elaborate on the very special. What I've got at the moment is the health um, uh, difficulties of the applicant and evidence by doctors in this particular circumstance and the sustainability. The sustainability. Okay. No, I think, I think we're... Did you want to add to that, just on the, that special circumstance argument? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the second clause, so apologies if this is already covered, but um, something around the, the length of time 
it's been there as a temporary build with someone living in it um, yeah might be a suggestion to be added <coughs> okay so members then um, the the motion for approval put with the conditions and the special circumstances outlined those members in favor of the approval please indicate those against that item is approved. Thank you. Our last item this evening, uh, referred item, Scalthurst Farm Lock and Road Canudan. Does anyone else want to go? chair so in essence this um, application seeks to remove condition 5 on an approval granted on the 22nd of June 1984 and the as in as on page um, 83.8.3.4 the condition specifically stated as follows which is the section paragraph 14 so notwithstanding the provisions of article 3 in class 1 Schedule 1 of the Town and Country Planning Development Order 1977, the dwelling shall not be enlarged or altered without the prior approval of the local planning authority. Just to clarify, if this condition were to be uh, imposed modern day, it would refer to classes A of Schedule 2, Part 1 of the General Permitted Devel Development Order. So that was the, the relevant um, legislation at that time. Now, fundamentally, um, as members may have picked up from the report, in terms of the issue of removal of condition, one has to consider what was the reason for imposing the condition in the first place. So there were very special circumstances which justified the replacement dwelling in the first place. Um, so the, just to explain... Scaldus Farm, you've got a cluster of buildings here, and this is the new house in quite a large curtilage. We're not sure of the origins of this building here. We have a photograph of it, but this is the house here in open countryside. If you can move on to the next slide, please. So in terms of the whole issue of the granting of permission, what that actually meant was is that it doesn't say that planning permission will not be granted for a for an app uh, for a extensions in future but it sets out very clearly on that consent that you know the that the the development will not benefit from the permitted development rights conferred by the order so the only way that a, an application would be an extension could be possible would be through the submission of a planning application now just going to the main issue so a new chapter's begun with a bill with when the new property was built if we can just move on a slide so we can just show the property as it is current day yes thank you so this is the property the property according to the planning records has a floor space of 142.57 square meters just move on to the next photograph thank you and that's the rear of the property and then uh, yep there we go. That, that is the large building at the rear. We're not too sure of the origins of that building. There is some site history um, on here. And what I would say is in terms of Scaldhurst Farm, um, I think the site history re relates to the cluster that is Scaldhurst Farm. And this obviously is a new development um, as a replacement for the bungalow. What actually is a quite, a, quite telling here is that members will note on page 8.3.3, .3, um, paragraph point eight that just before the submission of this application it would appear to me that two concurrent applications were submitted back in 1983 so members will note that 83326 alterations and extension to existing bungalow 
was refused in 3rd of 11th, 1983. Um, and then, well, no, sorry, in 1984, so there was an attempt to extend uh, the existing bungalow, and that was refused, and obviously that followed, sorry, the uh, by point 10, this, this development then granted um, sort of six months, six, seven months later. So really, in terms of the lifting of this condition now, we have to, th we have to consider in terms of the, the reasonability and, and the necessity of that condition. So we have to go back into the heart of what was the purpose of that condition in the first place. The planning permission quite clearly indicates that there was inference that it was twofold, recognising that it was an agricultural worker's dwelling, where size of the agricultural dwelling is, an, is to be controlled in the interest of maintaining it within reach of an agricultural worker. But also there was the second issue of in the interest of the maintaining green belt openness. What I would say is that the green belt policy on controlling and the mechanism to control extensions through the removal of permitted development rights has been consistent since the, since before this uh, original application was actually approved. So in terms of lifting or removing that condition, we have to look at whether the, the very fundamental basis of the imposition of that condition would be undermined if it was actually removed, and the answer would be it would be undermined. Current policy, the green belt, in terms of its location, hasn't changed, and policy really hasn't changed in the mechanisms it applies in terms of controlling further development subsequent to the initial development approved. And that is reflected, actually, in policy DM21, replacement of existing dwellings. And it's so the policy 30, over 30 years later, is still consistent, and members will note from the development plan DM21, the planning permission for replacement or rebuild of an existing dwelling will be conditioned with drawing further permitted development rights relating to the extension of the dwelling or provisions of outbuildings in the curtilage of the dwelling. Actually, just to clarify, this, uh, the withdrawal of permitted development rights on the original consent does not withdraw Class E development, which is buildings within the curtilage of a dwelling house. So there, there is no control on having a garage within the curtilage, but it controls actually what is currently Schedule 2 Part 1 Class A alterations to a dwelling house. So consistent with what's in the report in terms of, of the conclusion, there is no fundamental basis um, to, re to accede to the removal of this condition because the same safeguards in terms of safeguarding the green belt from enlargements of dwelling houses through the removal of PD rights, it was a fundamental and justifiable reason at that time and to remove it would be fundamentally um, undermining policy as it stood then which has carried through to modern day. So it's my recommendation that the application be refused on the basis that there is there are no very special circumstances that would outweigh the the prime policy consideration in this instance. Thank you, Councillor Stanley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, looking at the photos, that, the two photos that I've seen, there's plenty of room for an extension, and maybe the family do need an extension. There might be special circumstances in doing this in Greenbelt, as we've already indicated at the previous one. Um, there's no overlook of anybody, from what I can see, um, and it doesn't look as though it's going to be harmful, as it's all grass in any case. Um, so I think this should, and today's standards, people look today at doing extensions of a moderate size, and I think we should be up to the 21st century, not back in the 1970s or 80s or whatever it is that you're referring to. Um, so I do believe that this should be uh, approved uh, under the, you know, we're now living in the 21st century and families get a lot bigger. So I think this should be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members wanting to speak? We could start with Councillor Arno then. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, members and officers, this application, planning application has several elements to it. Its policy, lawfulness of the planning condition imposed, the permitted development in a particularly the Class E, and finally the full uh, back position which is a material consideration to any planning application. Starting with the policy position, this has been set out very thoroughly by our officers for which I am very grateful and do not intend to repeat it, apart to say that it has uh, very little uh, relevance in this case. In my view, Chairman, we first need to examine if the original planning condition imposed was lawful. I therefore draw the Committee's attention to the practical planning guide which is issued by the Government to assist local planning authorities when seeking imposed planning conditions. In my submission to the Chairman, I am of the view that this would be the starting point for any planning inspector reviewing this case. You will be relieved, Chairman, that I am not in intending to read out the practical planning guide. However, there are a couple of points within the document which I wish to highlight to this committee. Paragraph 206 of the National Planning Policy Framework states that planning conditions should only be imposed where they are necessary, relevant to planning and to the development to be permitted, enforceable, precise and reasonable in all other aspects. The document also goes on to state, and if I may quote this chairman, uh, conditions restricting the future use of permitted development rights or changes use will rarely pass the test of necessity and should only be used in exceptional ca uh, circumstances. The scope of such conditions needs to be precisely defined by the reference to the relevant provisions in the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development England Order 2015 so that it is clear e uh, exactly which rights have been limited or withdrawn, area-wide uh, or blanket removal of freedoms to carry out small-scale uh, domestic and non-domestic alterations that would otherwise not uh, require an application for planning permission are un uh, unlikely to meet the test of reasonableness and necessity. The re uh, to Chairman, to reinforce the point should only be uh, used in exceptional circumstances because it is unlikely to meet the test of reasonableness and necessity. This, uh, this Chairman is what a planning inspector will focus upon. However, if the committee are not with me on this particular point and consider that I have not made the case in this regard, I will move on to my next point which I highlight at the beginning of my uh, speech. I can, in fact, Chairman, deal with my permitted development point and fall back position together. When planning permission was granted for uh, replacement dwelling known as the uh, Scarterhurst Farm, it is quite clear on the face of the decision uh, notice that permitted development was only restricted to the main dwelling house. What are the implications of this? Well, well, the implications are these. Under Class E of the General Permitted Development Order of 2015, the owners of Scardhurst Farm can construct a substantial building only a few feet away from the rear wall of the, their dwelling house, subject to it being no uh, higher than four metres if, if it is a pitch roof and does not uh, take up more than 50 per cent of their garden area. Officers within their report talk about openness within the Green Belt. I would invite members to consider what would have a greater impact on the Green Belt openness, a modest extension to the main dwelling house or a, la a new large detached building that this uh, local planning authority would have no control over. This chairman is the planning fallback position of the owners of Skunkhurst Farm, which is a material planning consideration. In, in my conclusion, uh, Chairman, my final point is this. 
the uh, current dwelling on the site was a replacement dwelling for the original farmhouse which was constructed prior to 1948. It must follow that as the original farmhouse dwelling was constructed before the planning acts were introduced, permitted development was not restricted. Therefore, Chairman, the, the same should apply to its replacement and therefore I strongly recommend to the committee that the planning permit is granted for reinstatement of permitted development rights to Scudhurst Farm for my, uh, for my motion. Therefore, Chairman, is one of approval. Councillor Hockway. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> it would seem from uh, my interpretation of Councillor Liniani's argument is that um, that uh, the planning authority was wrong in its um, um, making uh, <clears throat> its conditions when the uh, building was replaced some 35 years ago. Um, however, the officers have argued the case that uh, they were just following our, our policy and um, uh, Greenbelt policy. So I can't see how that argument um, stands up. Um, and uh, <coughs> it would seem that uh, this is another issue about um, whether we set precedent with um, development in the Greenbelt again. Uh, I'm, I'm duty bound to point out that on the last item we did allow a replacement building based on very special circumstances and we specifically just took away ensured that permitted development rights in the green belt were removed so we're asking ourselves to undo the value of our decision some short while ago to come back yeah I was, um I'm still totally unclear as to what the special circumstances are because I haven't heard a specific argument what these extra special circumstances are to um, go against our uh, current Would any other members like to contribute perhaps a step to thanks Chair. when we're talking about uh, extensions to this property um, would things like conservatories that sort of thing be allowed in this particular instance Yes, if we were to remove, uh, allow this application, it would enable the ability to construct uh, conservatories as well in any form of extension. Uh, just to maybe come back as well, just on the the queries um, coming up with regard to the imposition of the condition from the 80s, um, it is something as well that we carry on to the current day, as been evidenced by the previous application. It's something that has been written, although we've got the obviously the, the planning practice guidance, material consideration and, and, the, and uh, what's written into that. Equally, a material consideration is our policy, and our policy still to this day um, requires us to remove PD rights um, when we're permitting um, new build properties in the green belt. Um, another thing to sort of mention with regards to the, the permitted development fallback is when we're considering fallback positions, um, we need to have clear understanding that it's um, realistic likelihood of that PD fallback um, being um, actually put in place on the ground. We haven't had any lawful development certificates submitted suggest any outbuildings would be constructed um, or any argument on that basis sort of put forward to us. Um, so it's not clear to us that that's got a realistic prospect um, necessarily of being uh, imposed on the site. Chair, could I just ask, <coughs> excuse me, um, this is a fairly isolated property. Uh, the surrounding properties, do <coughs> they have the same um, permitted development rights removed? Um, I won't know specifically without being able to look up sort of individual properties, but commonly um, what's happened is it's, it's new build properties in the green belt from around about the mid to late 80s that's when we started imposing those kind of conditions so those that properties that would predate that kind of time are unlikely to have those kind of conditions restricted on them i don't know if that helps in terms of era of the houses you might be referring to um but it is commonly from the mid to late 80s that we started putting that condition on replacement dwellings in the green belt one more time just come back on that so if i've got that right this is a, a fairly new build if it was the original building we wouldn't be having this discussion Yes, the original building is unlikely, obviously depending on its, uh, its age, I assume it's, yes, yeah, no, but unlikely we've had that condition put on it. Okay, members. Um, 
Councillor Iano, um put forward a case for approving this, but at this moment in time, it's the refusal that we've got in front of us on the table. So we'll 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 go to that. So eight point three point six. There is a recommendation for refusal on green belt grounds. Those members in favour of the of the refusal, refusal, please indicate. Okay, thank you. Those members against the refusal, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that item is not refused. Therefore, I come back to you, Councillor Iano. Um, would you like to restate your reason in the motion for approval and the very special circumstances that would allow this? And then I'll look for someone to second you. Chairman, I can only... Uh reiterate my, in my conclusion from my speech earlier that the current dwelling site was a replacement dwelling for the original uh, farmhouse which was constructed prior to 1948 and um, it must follow that as the original farmhouse dwelling was constructed before the planning acts were introduced permitted development was not restricted therefore um, the same should apply to the replacement and therefore I strongly recommend that this committee that the planning permission be granted for reinstatement of the permitted development rights to uh, Scudhurst Farm. My motion, uh, therefore, I'm could, could you could you outline something? Could you, could you further expand, please, as to which elements of what you've just said illustrate the very special circumstances? I would say that uh, uh, based on. Uh, the historical position, uh, which was not uh, carried forward appropriately and uh, unlawfully, so um, the uh, I think, uh, can, I, can I just yes, uh, sorry, give you a, a note of caution if you're just saying something happened okay. unlawfully. I could actually re quote. Okay, yes, I mean if it helps. Yes. Um, I think what I understand from the very special circumstances, or maybe what what um, what, what you 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 might accept is um, in relation to the size of the original dwelling house versus the replacement dwelling house, and the fact that the permitted development wasn't restricted in relation to the original dwelling house, um, that it's appropriate now um, to allow permitted development extensions on the replacement dwelling house. Okay. Is, can I ask if you've got someone who'll second you on that? Councillor Steptoe. We now can have a debate on that issue, and Councillor Hockway's indicated. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, can I ask the um, planning officers, is the, uh, the basis of Councillor Ilianu's um, um, argument of special circumstances, is that correct in, in terms of planning law? Because it would not seem to be correct. Opinion in law. Um, in terms of looking at very special circumstances, we're obviously trying to make it. It needs to be as unique as it can be to ensure that we're not setting a precedent throughout the district. I think if we were just looking at the fact that it was a replacement dwelling alone, there might be concern. But I think we've built a little bit more on that by referring to um, the fact that the PD was not restricted on the original. Um, the fact that um, the replacement is actually no larger um, than the original property and didn't perhaps have its PD added, which some do now. A lot of properties, replacements that we get in now, they actually add their PD in terms of their actual rebuild. This didn't happen to that property at that time. So I think we can perhaps, I think we've built on that a little bit more in a very special circumstance and I think we could go with that. Okay. Right, members, we have a motion for approval on the conditions outlined um, by, by the officers and the very special circumstances outlined and, and duly seconded. Those members in favour of the approval, please indicate. Those against? That item is approved. Thank you very much for your attendance this evening.